beating your pastor up in dominoes last night, but there's this little saying that comes to me, there ain't nothing jumping but the peas in the pot, and they wouldn't be jumping if the water wasn't hot, amen, you know, I don't know, that's just what I'm thinking, so, hey, listen, if I can hit the pause button just a second, while we were worshiping, Steve, I saw a vision of you and the Lord bringing a banqueting table up in front of you. And he said that you're going to enter into a season of sweet fellowship with him. And that's for you. And then I saw the Spirit of the Lord just come and hover over you. And it was just like a, a misty rain. And the Lord says, there's a time of refreshing for you. You know, I'm... I just say what he tells me to say, everybody. I don't mean to be in the limelight or anything like that. But then I saw you, and it's crazy. I saw God bring this big bucket full of water and take your shoes off and put your feet in it and said, isn't that good right there? You know? So there's a, some refreshing for you in where you've been walking. The Lord says he's going to give your feet. Uh, you know, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. Some, some rest for you, okay? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a bunch of words for people or anything, but I just want to be faithful to say the thing that he told me to say. Um, I've, I've had that happen to me a few times. I was over here in Rattan, not too far from here, on a Christmas Eve service, and all of a sudden, just in the spirit, I saw water kind of coming under the threshold, rolling down into the church, and I said, oh, Jesus, if I say something about that, they're going to think I'm nuttier than a fruitcake. And the Lord just said like this, because it becomes a point of obedience for you. He said, say what you see and leave it to me. So that's all I do. I say what I see. I leave it to him. It's up to you to determine. It, it's up to them to determine if that was right or if it wasn't. But um, I've done this a lot over the years. So anyway, I want to talk about, um, let me just pause just for a minute. So um, the river of the Lord was kind of running in here this morning. As you worship, the Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And so the river just kind of flows by the Spirit when we're worshiping. He creates an atmosphere that he chooses to work in. But I think one of the most important things that we need to talk about these days is the church becoming a house of prayer. And that might look different than the way we're doing things right now. And uh, building, you know, it's kind of one of those uh, interesting words. Because anytime you say the word building you start thinking of putting things together and that you're creating something positive, you're building a house or whatever. We don't tend to think of anything destructive when we hear the word building. And the basic definition means putting parts or material together to build something. But how many of you know if you don't put the right things together, you can build something that you don't want as well as building something that you do want. Just ask Dr. Frankenstein. It didn't turn out well for him as he started putting body parts together. By the way, God does have a body that has many members and they do have callings and they do have gifts. And when we're living according to how we've been called and gifted, God will put this thing together but sometimes what men put together can turn destructive. So, but what I'm wanting to remind us is that sometimes God does some demo work before he builds. And I'm not talking about a remodel job. I'm talking about that before you build, sometimes there's demo work. So we, we have a challenge for building buildings in Katy near Houston that you guys don't have here. It used to be old rice fields, so it floods easy. So you cannot build anything down there unless you build a retention pond to catch water. And so that means whatever you build, you're going to spend more money than you would anywhere else. I built a church in Waltahatchee, didn't have to have a retention pond. 
but I'm going to be hitting in another seventy to hundred thousand dollars just to get the land ready to build. Now, to build that pond, we have to tear down everything that's on the top of that land before we can build. Trees have to come down, old sheds have to come down, and so some destructive work has to happen before building can begin. That's kind of what Jeremiah is getting at, that when God told him, see, I've set you this day over nations and kingdoms, and look at the language he uses, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and plant. There are four destructive acts that have to happen before you're capable of building on it or growing a harvest on it. Any cotton farmer out in West Texas would know yeah. that if you've got a bunch of rocks in a field, you've got old stumps and stuff, you're going to have to cleanse that and get the ground ready so a harvest can be brought up in it. Same thing with building. And so these acts of rooting things out, of pulling things down, of destroying some stuff, and throwing down some stuff has to take place in order to build. And that is interesting because that is what the purpose of repentance is. The purpose of repentance, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying, prepare the way for the Lord. So if you want, so he said he's coming, but you have to prepare for him. And in order to prepare for him, you got to make the path straight. So there's some work that has to be done. There are valleys that need to be filled. There's low places that need to be filled up. And that mountains, high places have to be brought down. And crooked things have to get straightened out. And rough ways have to be made smooth. And that's kind of like what the work of repentance is in our lives, that when we're turning our life over to God, God starts straightening some things out, right? He takes some things that are crooked and off in our life, and he starts to make those rough areas a little smoother. That sometimes that there are places that are depressed that needs to be filled up and prideful things that need to be brought down in order to prepare a way for God to come and build what he wants to build. That's the way repentance works. It's like a demo crew coming in to clear the way so a highway can be built in different things. You don't have to go far down south, right, to see where they've cut through mountains to prepare a road that is drivable and that can prepare a way. So this is all I'm saying. Anytime you get ready to build, and how many of you think we should be building a house of prayer? Well, then I got to tell you something. Amen. This isn't working. Did I turn it off? Huh. Yep. Other way. There we go. I think Jesus used to have problems with his clicker, too. <laughs> Let's try it now. Oh, the bulldozers are coming. You want to build a house of prayer? God's going to clean some things up first. It's just going to happen that way. That the environment has to suit him. And that he'll start working on things in us so he can build what it is that he desires and what he wants. And so we see it in the scripture in other places too. Bring forth their fruit meat or bring forth examples of repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children for Abraham. But here it is, the axe laid to the root of the tree. That's repentance. It has to cut the things, the root that's causing the fruit to grow that is not the kind of fruit that's going to be successful for building what God wants that we can have things, can't we, that sabotage life. We can permit and allow things that prevent us. There are hindrances that are there, and the best thing to happen is for those to get the ax so they no longer feed our lives and a way is prepared and every tree that brings not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So it's like that. 
So building a house of prayer because demo, and I go, I don't get it, Pastor. I mean, I'm trying to relate how you're making this hit the house of prayer. Oh, what about that? What about when Jesus went into the temple and did demo work and said, I want to build a house of prayer? Is that the Jesus that you talk about all the time? Oh, yes, it is. Maybe you're not seeing him that way. But on that day, he went into the house of prayer and he did a little cleansing and that was part of the first steps for it to get back to being the kind of house that he wants. You get that, don't you? You know I love you. You know, I mean, if you don't, good news, I'm gone after this, and Bruce will be back. So, you know, praise the Lord. So, I mean, it's better to be here than in jail this morning, though, right? I mean, you know, you just got to put it in the right perspective. But Jesus shows up. This is after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Everybody's welcoming him, and he goes straight into the temple and he says, this thing has got to get cleaned up because it's not what my father wants. And he lights in and starts, the bulldozer comes in. And he starts cleaning it up. It's one of those crazy things. The scripture said it this, and he came to Jerusalem, and when he went into the temple, and he began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, he overthrew the tables of the money traders and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry a vessel through the temple. And then he said, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you made it a den of thieves. You stole from me what I wanted. Is what he was telling them that day. Now, I'm just a, a Texas boy, as you can tell from this accent, and just, you know, just, just a Texas guy. But I kind of know this. If you go to the International House of Pancakes, you're going to find something there. <laughs> Anybody got a slight guess at what that might be? Oh, pancake. If you go to a house of prayer, you ought to find, do we find the word preached? Do we find a lot of worship? But do we give prayer equal billing? I'm not saying we don't pray, but should it be noticeable that it's a house of prayer more than anything else? And so it should be. And so that troubles me personally as a pastor who oversees my own church. I don't, I'm not seeking to put any, by the way, I had a vision of you too, I forgot to tell you. I saw his right arm get real big with a battle axe in it. Breakthrough's coming. Breakthrough's coming. Yeah. And so it's interesting that Jesus had to go into the temple and root some things out. He had to pull down some stuff. He had to destroy it and throw it down. He had to remove everything that they had substituted for the real worship of God and prayer. He had to get that out of there. You just can't build on top of that stuff. You have to have the right kind of foundation. And realistically, what he was doing was what you would call a revolution and a reformation. He Everywhere he went, uh, there, was, there was an English bishop who said this. He goes, it's interesting. I find that everywhere Paul went, there was a revolution. Wherever I go, they serve a spot of tea. In other words, church just became something different. It's like, it's this enjoyable little spot of tea rather than a revolution against the things that are hindering the work of God in the lives of people today. It's anything that's demanding my time that takes me from Jesus and causes my loyalty away from something other than him. It's that thing that makes me not put the kingdom first, but if I do put the kingdom first, he said all these things will be added unto me. But I tend to pursue the things and want the kingdom to get added on, but the kingdom is never an add-on. It's the first thing's first thing. And that when that kingdom is first, then those things are added. We're never neglected by the Lord. Amen. We never have to worry about being neglected. But the revolution carries the idea of a revolt, 
which simply means to rise up, take arms, and overthrow the things that are changing our current and change our current situation. I must, as God's leader, look in how uh, my church is going. He must do that. Other leaders must do that. We as the people must do it united together as the body of Christ to not allow things to take the place and the primacy of prayer in our lives. It's too powerful to substitute something else for. Hmm. It's a reformation. And I like this scripture in Hebrews 9 through 10 when it's talking about to the old covenant ministry, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect pertaining to the conscience. In other words, all those sacrifices that were made, that were satisfying of the heart of God, it just couldn't cleanse that person's conscience. They had to keep going back and keep going back. And then it said, which stood in meats and drinks and different kinds of washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them now until the time of the Reformation. Until the time that Jesus come and it reformed under his leadership. The law was added because of transgression until the mediator came. And then it burst out into new life and into new power. Reformation literally means to reform and to form it again. So Jesus goes in. He's doing all this bulldozer work because he's wanting to provide the opportunity for the church to be reformed back into the Father's original purpose. It's always been his purpose. Even before Jesus, Isaiah was prophesying that it was supposed to be a house of prayer. And sometimes reformation means to restore restore back to its natural and normal condition. The most normal thing about the church is that it has conversations with God. The most normal. It's to restore back to the way that God made something. It's to make amendments in order to straighten things out. You know, things being raised up, made low, rough being made smooth. All that work, it's putting them back into right order. It's putting them back into the right arrangement. Ah, and this has always been the plan of the house of God. 700 years before Jesus comes, Isaiah prophesies and says, Also also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be a servant, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Hallelujah. You know what you can get here? You know what I can guarantee that you can get here before you leave? Prayer for whatever you're going through. Any stranger can come and get prayer. Any person that we don't know, they can have prayer. That one thing we can offer that the world cannot offer is prayer. One thing you can walk up to people that don't even believe God sometimes and just say, you mind if I pray? And they'll say, yeah, most of the time. That prayer is something that just resonates in the hearts of individuals and in the hearts of people. It's so important for us. And it's that kind of a, Reformation that I'm looking for, that this plan that has always existed, and I scratch my head sometimes, I said, why does prayer seem to be so hard for people when it says you can be joyful in the house of prayer? I said, we must be thinking about it wrong. We must be thinking about prayer the wrong kind of way because rather than it makes us happy, we go, well, I guess I better pray. I guess uh, we're going to have a prayer meeting up in church. I guess I'll drag myself on up there. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, but if they're serving tacos at the church, <laughs> I love church. Hallelujah. 
Isn't it crazy that sometimes prayer doesn't get the rating that a taco gets? How many are hungry for tacos right now? I am. I am. Yeah. This is what we need. We need the house to be a house of prayer again, to follow the footsteps of Jesus. And this is a revolutionary remaking of the house of prayer. All I mean is to make prayer the focus and center of the church again. That's all I'm saying. It's to give Jesus what he wants. He said he wants a house of prayer. And to pray transformational prayers, prayers that change everything. And to have reform a personal discipline for prayer that I'm making sure that I am disciplined to give him what he's asking for. And the day that Jesus went into the temple, it was both of those things. It was a revolution, and it was also a reformation at the same time because he literally overthrew everything that was going on in the temple that was preventing prayer from happening. That it is to be a house where you get to meet with God. That this is a house where you get to talk to God. That it is a house where conversations with the Almighty One can take place. That it is a house that when you come in and say, you get to talk to God here, and guess what? You can receive prayer here. And, you know, and why wait? Why wait till a church service? Why don't you just grab people at the door and say, I'm so glad you're here. Is there anything I need to pray with you about? Amen. I had a guy in the church, he always used to say it this way. Just pray for them. Amen. Slap the booster cables on them. Pow. Just pray. Hallelujah. Jump start that engine. Get it going. Just try it and see what happens. Just try that and have the boldness to see what happens. Hmm. It'd be a great testimony service. Let's all leave right now and go to Walmart and pray for everybody we see. And then come back and talk about it. Wouldn't that be awesome? Man. But in order to be a house of prayer for all nations, there are seven major changes that have to occur. There are seven things that we really do need to do. The first thing we need to do, now here's revolutionary now, pray the word of God. Just pray the word. Now listen, the word preached must become the word prayed. If you're going to preach it, then you've got to pray it. In Hebrews 4, 2, now this is interesting to me because for unto us the gospel was preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. It didn't help them. Why? Not mixed in faith that them that heard it. So I can come up here and I can preach this and it won't do a thing in the world for you unless you embrace it with faith and put it into practice. Hearing alone is not enough. I do not know what that word is up there. I'm pretty sure it's Hebrew. Hallelujah. It got to be mixed with faith, y'all. Huh. Immediate application of the word, pray. I mean, it's simple right there. Jesus said, make my house a house of prayer. Okay, let's pray right now. And we immediately applied the word. Just pray the word. You say, I don't know how to pray. Open the book and just pray it. Now use some good sense, right? Because don't do one of those things that people do where they close their eyes and open the Bible and say, God, just direct me to pray. And you point and you read down there, and Judas hung himself. <laughs> well, that one didn't work. Let's try it again. Go and do that likewise. Use some good sense when you pray the word. Amen. Here's what I know. We've got to pray the word. We're accustomed to being preached at. And we will know how to respond with a hearty amen. I can say, Jesus is a miracle worker, and we'll go. Now, do you really believe he is? Well, then say amen the right way. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. It's easy. We fully understand the concept of preaching the word and say, amen, so be it. Let it happen that way. But how about just pray it after we hear it? 
The scriptures challenge us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And the minute I pray the word, I'm doing something with it. In that second, I can start to pray. And if I pray, I can pray right now. Lord, I don't want to deceive myself. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, I want to be a doer of the word. I'm praying right now that I never deceive myself. Father, I pray that your word becomes sweet to my taste. I pray that your word is like honey in my soul. I can pray that word and it's already working. You say, I don't know how to pray. Just pray that right there. Just whatever you're reading, just turn it into a place of prayer. And you'll be surprised at how your life will not only be enriched with the knowledge of God's Word, but your prayer life will become very effective because when you pray the Word, you're praying the perfect will of God every time. Amen. But the preaching of the Word, as we saw, can be unprofitable for some because they don't mix it with faith that hears it. I don't think we get it. We say, well, yeah, brother, but faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. That's right. As I'm preaching, faith is coming up to you, but you don't have to receive it. Faith comes, but it doesn't necessarily stay unless you welcome it. Because I've seen it time and time again as we're preaching the word, somebody snoozing or sleeping. I'm like, well, it walked up and knocked on the door, but it didn't get to come in. There was no place made for it. And so it didn't, it didn't work. Hearing is not enough. We've got to apply it and be doers of the word. Two-thirds of pastors today will say revival is the most pressing issue for the church and that the clearest pathway to revival is prayer, that we don't preach our ways into revival. We don't program our ways into revival. We pray our way into an encounter with God. And so we've got to pray the word. Number two, we've got to have praying leaders. I, I want to say this with love. I need to say this with love, with great love. If you're leading and you're not praying, quit. Because you're not helping. Because you'll be powerless. You won't, you won't, I, I don't mean that ugly. I'm just telling you, we've, the pressing need today is not more preachers. It's holy men and women of God that carry his presence. That's what we need. We need the real deal. And you can't get real and not pray, everybody. We've got to have praying leaders, holy men of God, holy women of God. Nothing purifies us more than being in the presence of the one who has no sin in him at all. He shines the spotlight on me and cleanses me of any hindrances, and I'm more powerful because I spend time with him. People say, I don't know about that. Have you spent any time with him? Well, no. Well, you don't know. You got to do it. It's a primary responsibility. I want, to, I want you to see how important it is because I think, I always tell, I always tell Bruce when I come and preach, I said, I'm either going to help you or I'm going to give you job security after I'm gone. <laughs> I'll give you a mess to clean up. Amen. Prayer has to be modeled by church leadership. They've got to see leaders pray. It's a primary responsibility, and a prayerless leader is a powerless leader. And we've got to pray. We've got to mark out the place. Mark out an appointment with God. He's real, right? So we treat him like he's real. If you make an appointment to go to lunch with someone else and someone says, hey, I want to meet you at 12 o'clock, you say, I can't. I have an appointment. Just set your appointment with God and he's as real as any person you'll ever talk to and tell people, I can't. I have an appointment with God. And you'll get it taken care of that quick and that easily just by treating him as the God that he is. But look at this scripture that happens in the book of Acts. And in those days when the number of disciples were multiplied. And guess what? You're a growing church, right? It's multiplying in here. Got a new wing back there. Congratulations to all of you. Amen. And you got some parking lot done, stuff done. That's good, so you're making room for the future. But as you get more people, the potential for murmuring increases. You love me? I love you. 
So complaining can increase the more people you add into the mix, right? It's just people dynamics. It's not throwing stones at anybody. And in this case, the Grecians were having complaints against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily administration of food that the church was handing out. And then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples under them. So the twelve apostles said, everybody come on, let's gather together and look at the logic that happens here. And he says unto them, it is not reason, this is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over that business, but we will give ourselves, the leaders, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, uh, Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. They prayed them. They laid their hands on them. And look what happened. And the word of God increased. Why? Because those leaders were spending their time in the word. That's why. And the number of disciples multiplied. Why? Because they were praying more. But today, we have pastors that have to be the techno administrators of all kinds of stuff that rob us of time of prayer and rob our time in the Word. If you want things to flourish, you make sure that guy right there spends his time at the feet of Jesus and you'll hear Jesus talk to you when he steps up here. And you'll see the presence of Jesus when he steps up here. And it'll become attractive. It'll draw people into the situation because the first and foremost thing in being a house of prayer is that the leaders must be men and women of prayer. It doesn't mean we won't serve. It doesn't mean we won't grab hold of things. But if you have a choice between this guy setting up tables or praying, you must choose the praying if you want the power to be a resident within the church. It's got to be first. I can remember the first church I pastored. God bless those people. I walked in there at 23 years old, smarter than everybody in the world. And I wasn't smart enough to recognize when I walked in the door, the leaders walked up to me and said, well, thank God you're here, Pastor. Now we can sit down. There's your sign. But I missed it. And boy, it became a burden. The worst thing that could ever happen in the life of the church is to have a pastor who is burdened because of all the murmuring and stuff that they have to deal with. And that's not God right there. He is a man of like passions, as are you. That's why, in order to lead this and to stay current with what Jesus is doing, he better stay in front of the only one that knows the answers. Does that make sense? Protect that. Guard that. I'm thankful that in Katie, that's what they want. And so that's what I've got to give myself. That we need holy men of God who will bury themselves in prayer so they can preach fresh words from God. Pastor, how am I doing on time? Because I'm just going. All these men, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Hannah, Samuel, David, all of those, they were devoted to prayer. You see them constantly in front of God. They're just with him all the time. And here's one that we forget. And oh boy, put your seatbelts on. Tell the person next to you right now, put your seatbelt on, here it comes. The absence of prayer is sin. 1 Samuel 12, 3, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Man, I don't care how ornery that person is. I will sin against God if I don't pray for their help. I'm supposed to pray. 
And this is what they did in Acts 2, 4. As the Holy Spirit poured out on them, their first movement was they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine, the word, and fellowship, breaking bread, and in prayer. Prayer was the meeting, everybody. Prayer was not just something they did at the meeting, before and after the meeting, during the meeting, for the meeting, at the beginning and at the ending of the meeting. Prayer was the meeting. Talking with God was the meeting. Huh. Look, <laughs> you want something more than hearing me talk. You want him. You don't need what you need him. You don't need this. You need him. And you want to have that kind of church where you come and it just buzzes with conversations from God. So this means we got to start playing publicly. You know, well, there was that old teaching back in the day and people would say, prayer is a personal thing. It should be done privately. It should be done privately. It also should be done publicly because there's too many ex examples in the Bible. And by the way, this is one thing that I'm noticing that's interesting is that uh, our testimony in the world is becoming invisible. The Christian testimony is becoming invisible. You know how it gets visible? When you're praying. Just praying out in public. Have you done that before? I, I've done that multiple times. I've walked up to someone and said, I know you don't know me, but God said, I need to pray for you right now. If you're permitted, I'll pray for you right now. Just pray. Right there. Just pray in public. Get a group of young people and just let them pray. Just let them circle up and pray. Just find the place and just pray. See what starts to come out of those kind of things. Because right now where we're at, when kids are graduating high school, they're leaving the church by the hundreds. And Boy, if they just knew him, and they, I mean, if they just really knew him, they could never leave him. They could never leave. They just, just we're, we're not giving them something to follow. So I, I, my kids, like I said, they got really impacted at summer camp this year. And here they are three weeks later, I mean, three months later, and they're still burning up for Jesus. I mean, it's rolling. It's rolling. And we said, how come you never did this before? And they said, well, I never saw my mom and dad do it. They never saw the public prayer of their parents in situations. I'm not sure that's not true for everybody. But I'm simply saying I can never point the finger at our young people if I haven't been doing what I'm asking them to do. They have to see that it's so real to me that I'll do it as well. So we need that public kind of prayer. Our testimony cannot be invisible. Jesus himself prayed publicly. He prayed at the feeding of the 4,000. He prayed again in front of 5,000, and the miracle happened. He prayed in front of everybody when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he prayed as they were crucifying him and the world was watching him dying. He's praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, into your, my, your, your hands I commend my spirit unto you. He's praying as he's dying. He prayed in public. He was unashamed to talk to his father in the presence of other people. Oh, man. Corporate prayer can enrich personal prayer. I mean, what could be greater if I don't know how to pray to come alongside of my brother right here and he prays? What would be greater if I had a child in church and I knew that he could come and stand behind this man and hear him pray? That he could see his spiritual fathers or his spiritual uncles pray. And she could see her spiritual aunt and her spiritual mamas pray. That the place is a place of prayer. That we just pull in together. And that we are praying. And that our public prayer starts to enrich the prayer of our private one. And that there's corporate prayer encourages things, you see. It encourages and builds one another up when we pray. 
that corporate prayer that when we, we can pray the Lord, he taught them to pray the Lord's prayer, that corporate prayer forms the habit of prayer and it stirs other people up around us as we're praying. Could, could we just stop just for a second? Could we just pray together here just for a second? Just the most simple of all prayers. Could we just pray it out loud together and publicly and say, Jesus, make us a house of prayer. Would you pray that with me? Jesus, make us a house of prayer. Make me hungry for you. I want to be thirsty for you. You're the pearl of great price. Make us a house of prayer. You have no idea the measure of how powerful that is in the spirit. I tell you, heaven's ears perked up when it says, let us be a people of prayer to consider one another. And that personal prayer starts to enrich public prayer because praying in secret also is a path to open reward. But when you pray and enter your closet and you shut the door and you pray to your father in secret, the father which sees in secret all of a sudden starts rewarding openly where everybody sees it. It ignites things to have much prayer. We need a better theology of prayer. Okay, so I'm going to pick on you, all right? Nud, elbow the person next to you and say, get ready. He's going to pick on you just a little bit. And just say, now just a little bit. Because I do the same kind of thing. It's our habit. We need a better of theology because there that is again. I'm pretty sure that's not spiritual cussing up there, okay? You know, I'm just saying. It's kind of got that crazy look to it. Prayer tends to begin at the wrong place and ends at the wrong place because the best prayer does not begin with our needs. It doesn't start with our problems. And, it's, and so, you know, we, we want to carry our problems to the Lord, but we probably ought to honor Him first since He's the one that's going to answer the prayer. It, it almost sounds horrible sometimes if we all start saying to God at the same time, I'm going through a hard time and I can't do this and I can't. It's almost a confession of a lack of belief in the Lord sometimes. And I'm not saying those needs aren't real. I believe they are. And I'm not saying that God's not interested in help them because he is. But I'm saying you start with him. You don't start with the need. You always go, if I need healing, I must praise the healer first. You understand what I'm saying? Prayer sees him first. Behold the Lord's hands not shortened that it cannot save his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Or Isaiah 49, O Zion that brings good tidings. I like to start praying that way by celebrating him. Now, I know I've got this situation going on, but I like to go and say, oh, Lord, thank you that you, there are good tidings. The Christ has come and paid the price for sin. The Christ has come, taken stripes upon your back in order for healing to come. I rejoice you're the healer. I rejoice that you are the miracle working God. I praise you that you're all wise and proficient and that there's nothing lacking in you. Father, I thank you that you're the one that spoke the worlds into existence, that heaven and earth moves, God, as you move. I praise you and honor you. I give you great glory, O oh God. Now, Father, I'm asking you to help me with my finances now. You've got to start with him. You always start with him. Because I'm going to tell you this. If I got all my needs answered in this life and I'd miss my relationship with him, yes. I missed it all. I missed it all. Uh, we just need a theology that puts him first. I'm going to move faster. So we start by celebrating God because... Gratitude to God opens the gateway to his grace. That thanking God sincerely for who he is first before you can ask what he can do. That worshiping him for his goodness and his loving kindness. That remember the greatest answer to prayer is not getting what you ask for, 
But the greatest answer is you got the one that has the answer. And that changes it. So we start by celebrating God. And this one is an important one. If we discipline ourselves to prayer, we might start delighting in it. See, the problem is, is we call like this, we call prayer meetings and people don't come. They don't delight in prayer. It seems like a burden. It seems like a hardship. That a conversation with God seems like a demand and I don't have time for and all these kind of things. It all works. We've all done it. I've done it. Not conclaiming perfection. I'm claiming the, or proclaiming the idea that he wants a house of prayer and I'm finding my way to him. But I know that sometimes you have to discipline yourself first before you can delight in something. How in the world are you going to love prayer until you pray? You just can't. You got to do it before you can start to love it, is what I'm saying. Otherwise, it becomes this ritualistic thing that you do that has no relationship in it for you. It's not meeting with him. It's that all of a sudden we're just going to pray our way through some things and I fulfilled my responsibility. It just sounds terrible. But I like that look because it's just an example. It just looks like she just loves prayer. I just love prayer. I'm married to a woman that loves prayer. Oh, man, you have no idea. <laughs> Uh, she is a celebrator of the Lord. Her scripture, her life scripture is, be still and know I'm God. Her mama was an old prayer warrior. I'll talk about them in a minute. I'm, I want to get to the end of this because I want us to take a second to pray this morning. So prayer is not hard when you love it, right? It's not hard to do anything that you love. But it's complicated when we don't delight in some things. And most of the time, we rush into prayer without quieting our spirit. We just verbalize the words and we're done. And we don't know that he's God. And we're not spending time with him. But prayer is that great equalizer. When you do it, it changes things. It's worth the time. It's worth the effort. I can remember one morning going over to my brother's house early. And this is one of the... the Texas girls, their vocabulary works a little differently. And my sister-in-law comes bursting out of her bedroom. She'd been in prayer this morning. And she'd come out and she went like that. Son, that was a meeting with God right there. <laughs> and I thought, she liked that. Oh. You can love your church. You can love your worship team. You can love the preachers, let the preachers preach good. You can love the fellowship, but none of those will ever take his place for you. You've got to talk to him. You've got to start talking to him. And then you'll love that because there's something in you that wants him. And when you start talking, that inner craving will start to be satisfied. And when prayer becomes your great delight, becomes a part of your lifestyle. It becomes your food. It becomes your breath. It becomes consistent and you know him like you've never known him before. Life goes to a whole nother level. Yeah. It does. One more thing a church has to do. You've got to identify your intercessors. And everybody may not, everybody can pray for others, that's intercession when you pray for other people instead of yourself. But then there are intercessors. They're a different kind of people. And you got to identify who they are. You may not be one. It's okay that you're not. But God calls some people to be intercessors. And their whole life, they stand in the gap between the living and the dead. And they call for divine connections. And that was my mother-in-law. <laughs> I never can talk about her without crying. I heard heaven in my home when she prayed. 
It's just different. It's just different. She was one of those kind that they, they talked differently in those days about prayer. They were one of those kind that would say, God burdened me for someone. And they locked in and pray. And it was like, if you, if you heard it, it was like a woman giving birth to a child. It was gut-wrenching. They called it, in the Bible they use that word too, travail. With much travail, children are born into the kingdom. They birth answers to prayer, and they just wouldn't quit until they felt a release from God. I don't know how many times it's three in the morning and my mother-in-law in there, oh God, oh God, oh God, praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. Oh Lord, I pray for your intervention. God, oh God, I'm laying up in bed. I'm, going, I'm a backslid preacher laying up on this bed and my mother-in-law's in there and she's waging a war for people to be set free. It sounds different. It's different. She was a lamb to talk to, but when she prayed, she turned into a lion. That's, that's who my wife learned from. I, I live for God because if Cheryl prays for me, man, he's going to get on me because she, she's going to make that connection. We need to know who those intercessors are. We need to identify them in the church. And that we need to be channeling those prayer requests to them because these are people that just abandon. They immediately, poof, go in the spirit. They just abandon themselves to God. They just do it. I don't know. But you got to do that because you can't build a baseball team if you don't recruit players. And you can't have a choir if you don't gather singers. And you can't have intercession if you don't gather the intercessors to come and stand in the gap. And here's what the intercession is about. As we identify them, it's about adding the harvest to our intercession. We got to have harvest eyes. We got to look out there, and every time we're going to leave here and we're going to go to dinner, I want you to scan that people, all those people enter and say, Some of those aren't making it. Some of them aren't going to make it to heaven. I got to have eyes for the harvest, and I've got to get in my intercession closet and pray the Lord of the harvest like He told me to. That's part of the house of the prayer, is that we pray for the salvation of people and that we start to call out and intercede that God would raise up, that the harvest would come in, that people would be saved, that everything that Jesus died for will be implemented and that we're praying for those kind of things because we know without a vision the people perish. But if we have harvest eyes and we're praying for the salvation of humanity, people will start to come to faith in Christ because we're being the house of prayer when we pray for the harvest. Ladies and gentlemen, we are commissioned to prevent people from perishing. That is our great commission, to go into all the world and share the gospel with everyone. And it means we're to have a vision for it, to have harvest eyes, to pray for the house and to pray for the nations. He said a, pray to a house of prayer for all nations is what he said, that we're to be that kind of people. And we got to remember, the Bible calls us a royal priesthood. See, how do we get to this place where we let what the Bible says really inform who we are and our identity? Because it says, it really says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Oh, I'm just a Christian. I, no, 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 no. You've been called offer sacrifice to God. You're a royal priesthood. You've been called to let incense go up before the throne. And that's what the Bible says in Revelation, that that incense is the prayers of the saints. We have been called to stand in the gap and pray for people. And we're commissioned to commi prevent them from perishing and that we have to start seeing ourselves as priests unto God and to intercede for the lost to be saved, to bridge the gap. And there's that scripture that says that we're a royal priesthood. I'm going to hurry up and finish. The intercessory function of the priest is, we see it in number 16, and Aaron took Moses 
as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. We are positioned by the Lord as a truly genuine functioning priest. You say, I'm not qualified for it. He said you were. Why don't you just try it? Why don't you just try it? To stand between the living, the Christ, the King of glory, the head of the church and head over all things to the church for of him, through him, and to him are all things. And stand between those who are dead in their sins and their trespasses and to lift our hands between the both and say, God, I lift up prayer for the lost. I lift up prayer for my brother who's not serving you. I lift up prayer for my aunt, for my uncle. Father, I lift up prayer for my neighbor next door. Father, I stand in the gap. I pray that you create divine appointments. I pray that you break down barriers. I pray that the demo work that destroys the works of hell that you paid for on the cross of Calvary is shattered, is broken. Father, I pray for the wells of salvation to spring up into everlasting life. And when your church starts praying like that, in one mind, in one accord, God's harvest will start coming in, will start leading people to Jesus, and we will be empowered to be who we're supposed to be. I'm sorry, but this gospel was meant for more than being preached to save people every week. It was to go around the world. And thank God it's preached to save people. I like it, don't you? That right there, that's a T-bone steak. Hallelujah. But we must stand in the gap. And this is what God said. One of the most depressing scriptures in the Bible for me. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. <sighs> Nobody would say yes in Ezekiel's day. Let's say yes. Let's say yes. The obligation of a kingdom of royal priests is to call to the harvest in prayer. It's to pray in the harvest. It's to pray that we become laborers for the harvest, that we have harvest eyes. It's time to pray, everybody. It's time to be a house of prayer. How do we do that? We pray the word. Our leaders pray all the time. We pray publicly. We start and we end celebrating God when we pray. We delight in prayer. And intercessors rise up and stand in the gap with harvest eyes. If we start doing that, things will start changing. It's time to pray for a revolution of prayer. It's time to pray for transformational prayer and the revival of prayer. It's time to get rid of all hindrances to prayer and let Jesus do it. I'm praying today that a mantle of prayer comes upon us. Hallelujah. How many of you in here, you know you're an intercessor? You're one of those kind. How many? Did anybody know? Come on. Come up here. Come on up here. You got to see this. You got to see this. Thank you for coming. They're always here. Intercessors are always among us. You know what you see? When they hear a message like this, you'll see tears start to flow. You'll see it. It'll start to move in their spirit. You know what else you'll see? They always wear T-shirts about prayer, too. It's crazy. <laughs> It's a big deal to them. We've got, to, we've got to pray for our intercessors, right, this morning? Can we do that? Can we pray that they'll be empowered to stand in the gap? Because here's what I know. Intercessors are so powerful in the force of the kingdom that the enemy would do anything to hush their mouths. But we, we're not going to let that happen. Your responsibility is to always pray for your intercessors as well as pray yourself. So stretch your hands towards them, Father. In the name of Jesus, we're just going to lay our hands, Father, on them. We pray that you release the power of intercession, Father, in Jesus' name, in this church. That these are burden bearers that travel, Father, to the altar of God. 
that is full of the fire of the Spirit, that when they pray, Father, hell is shaken. Father, that when they pray, the death grip of the enemy is broken. That when they pray, the righteousness of the Lord ascends into heavenly places. That when they pray, God, people are healed. That when they pray, the back of the enemy and the finished work of Jesus is executed. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' now. Now, all of us together, we're praying for the lost. Father, we're lifting up the lost in Jesus' name. We're turning into a house of prayer. There are people that don't know Jesus, Father. They're headed to a devil's hell. They're headed to a hell that was never created for men. And we're standing in the gap, Father. We're praying that you break hindrances, you break bondages. Father, that you open up the life gate of the King of kings and the Lord of glory. Father, that you anoint every leader in this church. Father God, that the children's leaders, God, that children come to Jesus. Father, that teens come to Jesus, Father, and that the teenagers are ministers of fire. Father and God, that the young adults, Father, they come and the adults and all of us, Father God, that we begin to put prayer into everything that we do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now I want to do this right quick. I want these intercessors to pray. How many of you need healed in your body right now? You need God to touch you. You need a healing. Just lift your hands up. I'm going to let you stay right where you are. All right, intercessors, let's all pray. Father, in Jesus' name, God, by your stripes we are healed. You took our sicknesses and in our infirmities on your body on the tree. Father, we declare you are the healer over arthritis that you are the healer of our eyes, that you are the healer over cancer, Father, that you are a healer, Father, over intestinal problems, that whatever is going on, Father, that you are the healer. Father, we pray that you release the healing for the minds, God, that are tormented and the lack of peace and the struggles of the previous week. They melt under the presence of God. Father, Lord, that you are healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, I want to pray one more thing. Financially distressed. Financially distressed. You, you, need, you need God to intervene in your finances. Okay. All right, Father, right now we're praying that help is on the way. Father, that you own everything. That it all belongs to you. That you know how to orchestrate divine appointments with the right people at the right time. Father, you know how to gift your people with what they need so that they are foundationally secure in their finances so they can be contributors into the kingdom. Father God, we pray that they advance and that they prosper even as their soul prospers. And Father, that you meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks. Now let's just praise him for a minute. Thank you, Lord. All over the place, publicly, lift up our voice. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We honor you. Your eyes over the righteous. Your ears are open to our prayers. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy, 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 worthy. Worthy. You're good. You're good. Your mercy endures forever. Your loving kindness is without end. Merciful one, just and true. Captain of our salvation. Hallelujah, the God who saves by blood. You sent your word and you confirmed your word, Father. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. And now I just pray for you that, Lord, you would take each one of us to a different place of prayer than we currently are. And, Father, that it would become one of our great delights in the Lord that just talking with you thrills us like nothing else thrills us. Father, let our young people be men and women of prayer. And, God, let our elders be men and women of prayer. And together, let there be the dance between the young and the old in the place of prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right? Um, Ezekiel twenty two thirty says he looked in the gap. Just he looked for a man to stand in the gap, and he found no one. Job twenty two thirty says he will even deliver the one who is not innocent. He'll deliver them through the purity of our hands. Twenty two thirty. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you all very much. Hallelujah. Let's all stand to our feet.